10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and they're off. 9 a.m. Mountain time. The 2021 American Solar Challenge showcased single occupant and multi occupant vehicles from nine college and university teams participating in a 1,000 mile cross country event that followed the Santa Fe Trail. Starting in Independence, Missouri, and finishing in Las Vegas, New Mexico, the primary objective for all teams was to successfully complete the base route of the event without having to trailer their solar cars. I caught up with the teams at the end of the first stage in McPherson, Kansas, and had the pleasure of interviewing two of them about their experiences with this year's challenge, and of course, to learn about the cars. So let's hear from Appalachian State University about their winning multi-occupant vehicle that looked more like a sports car than the other cars, and Principia College about their asymmetrical single occupant vehicle. All right, so I'm here with Sam Cheatham of the Appalachian State University team. Yeah. I understand that you guys are the first team that has arrived at the McPherson stage that is multi-person. Right, yep, so we finished second in the track race, which meant we took off behind Minnesota today, but we beat him here. Awesome, so tell me a little bit about the car. So this is ROSE, it's an acronym, it stands for Racing on Solar Energy. Okay. Uh, it has two seats in it, top speed is about 65 miles an hour. Today we drove at about 47 miles an hour. Uh, brigade goes down the road and uh, the solar panels are what's giving us power. Excellent. So is it powered entirely by solar or are you guys using the solar energy to charge batteries, which then powers the car? So we have a battery. We can charge the battery using like an outlet or we can charge the battery using our array of solar panels. So it's both. Okay. So at nighttime, you know, if this was your car, you would charge it up in your garage and then the solar panels would keep it running, like just add charge. Yes. Okay. Very cool. So talk a little bit about the process of starting the, the build and the idea. Naturally, this is not something you guys came up with overnight. This has right. been uh, in the works for a very long time. Uh, where did you guys start? What's the process? So the first car we got, actually the body was donated to us by Iowa State. Okay. Um, and that was a Challenger car, which is just a one-seater. Mm -hmm. um, we raced that car twice, and we got ready to build our uh, Cruiser class, which is what this does. Um, sure. So uh, we built this one from scratch. We got the body. Um, like made for us, it's made out of carbon fiber. Our university wrapped it, and these solar panels have been on our car since 2018 when it last raced. With the the design of the car your, itself, yep. um, it is a little different in design to say Minnesota um, and their yep. catamaran yep. style. Um, talk a little bit about where you guys, um, you know, how you came up with the decision to uh, not go full out like they have. So if I understand the story right, and I wasn't here, but uh, one of the lead designers on this car was actually a uh, like furniture design major uh, and did stuff like that. And um, basically just wanted it to look like a car. So, uh, I mean, it's pretty aerodynamic, but uh, we wanted it to look like kind of real, you know? Yeah. So um, just like something you might see on the road. So sure. uh, we kind of went for style and beauty and uh, it's a, we love how the car looks and we're, we're super happy with it. And um, you know, it's not, uh, as slick as a catamaran like some of them, but uh, you know, we got here first, so. Well, it definitely looks very good, and obviously kudos to you guys for uh, building something that is certainly performing as well as it looks. Right. So you guys are taping up all of the gaps to yes, help sir. with airflow and, and keep air from going into the, the gaps of the car yeah, itself. Yes, so on your car, your tires are exposed, but uh, since we have a really big wheel well, we have what's called fairing doors, which is what's covering them up. They actually do remove, but yes. if they're out while they're driving, a ton of air gets in that wheel well, and it slows the down a pretty sure. good bit, so it's way more aerodynamic with the, the fairing doors. Do on. you happen to know what the coefficient of drag is for this car? No, I don't. But yeah, it's pretty aerodynamic. So how many drivers do you guys have for the car? So we have four drivers. Um, we have a total of eight passengers, but that includes our four drivers. Okay. So there's basically, we're taking shifts. Uh, everybody's like switching out. We have a driver paired with a passenger. And okay. Like, they drew straws at the track race to see who would go first, and now we're kind of just picking it on who's had the most sleep. Uh -huh. uh, we stay sure. up late working on this car. So you oh, know, yeah. if, you, if you stay up all night, you can't drive the, the car for hours and hours with the wind and the, all the Naturally. Factors, oh, yeah. Know, so. I mean, it's not like it has uh, cruise control or any uh, yeah, <laughs> lane keeping right. assist or yeah, anything our, like our that. Yeah, our lead uh, electrician, Matt, is he's been our MVP so far for sure. He's done a lot of great stuff, but um, he hasn't driven much yet because sure. he's up all night working on yeah. it. So, uh, but we have four designated drivers, and we just switch them out. Okay. So. Have you guys noticed, I mean, obviously, there's a, a haze 
from the fires in Oregon and Canada on the West Coast. Have you noticed that that's affected things um, or changed your plan at all so far uh, in terms of the energy that you're able to recoup from the solar panels? So we haven't adjusted our strategy for that yet. We think we're going to face it more in Arizona and New Mexico, but sure. we did see some of that smoke in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, yeah, we'll see, we'll see what we get. It. I mean, it's pretty clear out here today. Um, we're hoping for clear skies. Very cool. Well, hey, that's, I'm going to end it there. But Sam, thank yeah. you so much for talking to me. I appreciate it. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and they're off. 901. I'm here with Robbie and Billy of Principia College in Elsa, Illinois. You guys have, as I understand it, one of the fastest cars so far. I mean, obviously, you know, this is just the beginning of the early stages here in McPherson. Billy, can you start by uh, telling a little bit about the story of the car and how you guys uh, really have progressed to get to this point? Well, that's, that's an interesting story. Uh, we've been around since 92 or 93, so this is the 11th iteration of the vehicle. And it's gone through a number of iterations, primarily driven by rule changes from the race organizers, along with a couple other things. Uh, I was able to be in on the manufacturing, uh, manufacturing build of Rot 10, the previous vehicle, and now I've been able to go through the design and manufacture stages of Rot 11. This particular vehicle is different from our previous ones in that we kind of skipped a year because of the interesting national situation which everyone ran into. Yes. So we had to outsource a lot of our work because we didn't have access to our shop in the same way that we would normally. Um, what we typically do is we purchase the larger components and assemble them in-house. This particular year, we had to outsource our manufacturer for the body itself. Um, but just about everything else on there, we have had a pretty significant hand in building. Um, we get a raw carbon fiber shell, and we trim that, fit that, uh, attach it to the frame. We work with a welder over in Fenton, Missouri, who does some amazing welding on chromoly. And that's... That's taken about a year and a half with a portion of that being a, a bit of a hiatus because no one could do anything. Uh, and I think that's that's honestly been one of the biggest challenges for this is that we had a massive stretch where we couldn't touch the car, we couldn't touch the shop, and we were just focused on some portion of remote work. Um, we were originally planning on building this car for the 2020 American Solar Challenge race, which would have been from uh, more or less independence to Boise, Idaho. But we are now racing on the Santa Fe Trail with this vehicle, and it's, it's reasonably similar to our 10th car in that it is still the catamaran four-wheeled style, so it's an asymmetrical design, um, which presents a couple design issues here and there which we've been able to overcome. We've, we've been able to reuse some of the parts, but a good portion of it is almost completely remanufactured on donated funds. Sure, sure. So I understand that, that you guys are considered to be the underdogs. So if you could speak to that, I mean, how much of what he has said is not something that you would say is affecting other teams? Um, well, the biggest thing was just our time, our time stretch. Uh, cars, new cars aren't built every year. They're expensive machines and they take a long time to manufacture, design all of the bits. And so uh, really, it was just coincidence that all of this came together at this time and really what what got us in the most trouble was the position that we were at when the pandemic hit mm -hmm. and uh when we got to go back and sure. so uh one of our advisors really said it best he said we were doing two to three years of work in the past three months so we actually showed up just before this event, so this is the first day of our road race yes. in American Solar Challenge. We were uh, over at Heartland Motorsports Park in Topeka, Kansas. Basically, the way that that event was staged, that's technically the qualifier for this yes. event. Um, and we arrive there three days before the race and go through a really intense scrutineering technical review. And that is basically, do we comply to the regulations? Is our car safe enough to go on to the public motorways with other vehicles um, and all of this insane technical inspection testing before getting out on the track and qualifying by doing a certain number sure. of laps. So to meet all of those safety regulations, I mean, that really in, in many ways can be somewhat of the, the, the most challenging 
aspect, at least before you're on the road. Um, how do the regulations for the American Solar Challenge ca compare, say, to uh, the race that they have in Australia? The solar race. Ah, that is a great question. There's actually a group called the ISF that is working to remediate the differences between those two. One of the primary differences that you'll see, for instance, this race is that instead of having stage stops where everyone has to stop at the end of the night, the Australian race, you just go after you go to the stage stop and you can go as far as you go. They don't have the loops to add distance to it. Uh, it's not as closed in and packed together as this particular one is. The, the Australian one is significantly less focused on media, and this one has a lot more visibility because it actually goes through somewhere with people. Yes. Uh, the middle of the outback doesn't <laughs> not quite. really have too many people. So that's one of the differences. There are also some significant safety differences between the two. In the Australia uh, regulations, there is a specific difference that we had designed into RAW 10, which did race in Australia in 2017, that we don't have in this particular vehicle, which is the roll cage shape. The front roll cage that we designed in RAW 10 has a bit of a shape like that, whereas this one can be more of a U. Sure. And the reason for that is the Australian regulations. They have a particular safety requirement for where the for how the driver's head can move um, at the same time the US races have I'd say slightly more strict analysis requirements than the Australia one at least the 2017 requirements that I'm familiar with um, generally speaking the US one is based more on US laws mm -hmm. and the Australia one is based more on Australian laws and can tend to be um, a little different in how they approach safety. Sure. Now, I, uh, from what I've heard, all of the, the solar cars that are competing for the, the ASC this year are, in terms of regulations, would be able to compete in Australia, but not necessarily the other way around, that the Australian mm -hmm. cars, some of them might not meet the regulations, the safety requirements for the race here. Um, that sounds reasonably accurate. I'm afraid I'm not familiar with sure, the most recent Australian fine. regulations <laughs> to say much more than that. Sure. Okay. Okay. So in terms of the car that, that you guys are running, right now it, behind us, you have the canopy facing the sun. Mm -hmm. How much of a charge, like I'm assuming that you've got a battery pack that, that <laughs> gets charged. How much of a charge can you expect to get from sitting here for an hour or two? Well, the race regulations intend the cell, the excuse me, the solar array to be around about a kilowatt. So most teams here that you'll see are using silicon cells. Okay. Uh, once you get into the World Solar Challenge and some of the others or teams that have a lot more money to spend, you'll see gallium cells, which they cut down the number of the size of the array. So ours okay. is a four square meter array. The gallium will go down to three or sometimes a little, a little over two and a half, depending on the type they're using. Um, so with all of that is intended to ensure that there's a reasonably even playing field there between the amount of charge that a team can get. So most of the teams here will average around a kilowatt on their array, but that does depend on how well, the, how well they've installed it, uh, who their encapsulator is, and a number of other technical factors within that. Sure, to be able to, to be efficiently capture that energy. Exactly. In addition to the weather. Like, oh, of course. <laughs> tonight well, it's a bit hazy, so. And that's actually something that I would imagine is going to affect naturally all of the teams uh, as you get out to New Mexico where, you know, there's some fires going in, in Oregon and Canada. Uh, has that affected your plan or your approach to how you, you're looking to uh, continue on through the rest of the stages? It has impacted it in some degree. The real difference will be in the real difference will be dependent on whether there are other weather factors which add on top of that. If we have reasonably clear skies otherwise, we will get a drop in the efficiency of the cells because of that. We might, if I were to estimate, it would it would be not minimal, but probably not more than a tenth mm -hmm. of a reduction. That At least that's our hope. Sure. Uh, we'll have to see after we get the numbers back from charging tonight, though. Okay, okay. So, naturally, being in the EV world, 
Uh, I talk to a lot of members of the public that just aren't familiar with solar technology and how that relates to vehicles. And everybody's always asking, well, why can't we just cover passenger cars with solar panels and then just run off of that? Uh, what would you guys say is kind of the, the, the technology or the way the technology would hopefully trickle down to passenger cars at some point to be able to use solar to at the very least assist some of the electrical load mm. that that they do use mm -hmm. well i mean i think we're kind of seeing a great example of that right now right now is an amazing time to be interested in electric vehicles with so many new competitors coming out with amazing vehicles that are developed each and on their own um, within a lot of those vehicles you're seeing solar cells being attached uh, along the top of the vehicle to supplement that power just like you were saying so really just the addition of that just takes less less wear off of the off of the power grid and can really increase the efficiency and 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 lessen the impact of the electric vehicle sure yeah. on top of that you do have some teams uh, whose members go on to build uh, more highly integrated cars in terms of solar. Uh, over in the Netherlands these days, there's a group called, uh, there's a car called the Lightyear, Lightyear One, I, be mm -hmm. I believe. And yes. that came from a team which races at the World, World Solar Challenge. So you're already seeing some of that trickle down. We also have the multi-occupant vehicle class mm -hmm. here. Uh, the single occupant vehicle is, in my opinion, designed primarily to drive the technology and to help innovate some of that, while the multi-occupant vehicle class is designed to showcase some of that and implement some of the features, some of the more practic practical and comfort features that consumers would expect to see, but that we don't have in our more race and innovation focused vehicles in the single occupant class. Very good, very good. So where do you guys think you'll end up once you uh, finish I can't even say. <laughs> there's there's so many things that could happen just just in the blink of an eye, sure. from from simple things to hitting a nail and having to do a ch tire change in the middle of a day to something major, a, a major failure. Uh -huh. So you really can't tell, especially at this stage. Sure, sure. Well, I wish you both the best of luck and, and with the whole team, and I can't wait to see where where you guys do end up. Thank you so much for talking with me. Thank My you. pleasure. In the end, Principia College finished third in the single occupant vehicle class behind Kentucky in second and MIT in first. App State won their multi-occupant vehicle class ahead of Minnesota. Neither team needed to trailer their cars at all. For more information on the teams and the American Solar Challenge, you can go to americansolarchallenge.org.